as I said in the monologue, I've been a fan of this man for many, many years. You know him from The Simpsons, from The Birdcage, and now he's got this new amazing program uh, on HBO called The Idol, which I want to hear all about. But more than anything, I just want to geek out with him because he's a New York sports fan. Hank Azaria, welcome to the season with Peter Schrager. Thank you, Peter. Very happy to be here. I've told you uh, in person and now through Zoom and now in front of everybody, I'm a big fan of yours, so I'm excited to join you I'm as a, a sports fan. fan. And just as a, just as a human being, I am well. a uh, I am a great purveyor of of pop culture and sports. So it, it, can I share where we saw each other in the most amazing of situations? I'm yeah. jogging. So if you if you know me and you see me, I'm not in shape. I'm trying to get in shape. So I was jogging one morning, like putting on a farce that I'm going to suddenly be the guy who runs around Brooklyn Heights, <laughs> and I'm running and. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Hank Azaria, and I'm like, it was eight in the morning, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. I love this guy. Do I stop? Do I keep on going and listen to my Mark Marin podcast as I'm running around the block, <laughs> or, or do I just? Uh, and then Hank gives me the nod. And I'm like, I gotta stop. We had an awesome short conversation, but I didn't even know you lived in New York. I love the fact you're a New Yorker. I grew up in Queens, moved back here 10 years ago. I had seen you a little before, just from a distance at the Nick game, one of the Nick playoff games, one that they won. Um, so yeah, and I've been, you know, I know, I know you anywhere. I've been a fan for a long time. The Knicks thing was cool because Joe Shane, the GM of the Giants was there and he was sitting, I guess, a row in front of you. And I go and say hi to Joe and Mike Breen starts coming up from the stands. And I think Mike Breen's making a gesture to say hi to me. And I, I was about to geek out about it. He blows right past me and I look behind me and there's Hank Azaria that Mike Breen is saying hello to. I'm like, all right, that's humbling. That's fine. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Love Mike Breen also. I've been chatting with him for years at Nick games and elsewhere. Oh awesome voice uh the move to new york you were in california for years i'm sure because i'm raising a kid in new york now too um and it's a fight every day and yet i'm trying to grit it out like why did you move back to new york from from la after all those years one of the reasons was you mentioned kids i i really didn't want to raise my son in the midst of show business which you can't avoid in los angeles there's, there's just no way um so i wanted him to have a more eclectic, a more, uh, you know, varied look at humanity than just through the lens of people who work in show business. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything wrong with those people, but no. it's really only one province heard from. And um, this sounds like a joke, and it kind of is. It's only half a joke. I, I wanted to raise a Mets fan. Um, yes! Cool. Uh, I love just that. so that I have support for this in my old age. And even in doing that, and it's worked, I have a Mets fan. He's about to be 14 tomorrow, in fact. Oh, congrats. I'd say twice a year, though, all through his childhood, he has come to me very earnestly and said, Dad, are you sure we can't be Yankee fans? Yeah. I'm like, it's a very smart question. I don't blame you for asking it, but no, sadly, we can't. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Uh, and the Mets this year, everyone picking them before the season to win the World Series. They actually got hot again, but it's so funny. I'm like, all my Mets fans, I'm like, are you guys seriously buying in? I mean, you know something, sure enough, they start the season, just a million things go wrong. But that's the well, life and the ethos of being a Mets fan. Yeah, I'm Mets, Jets, Knicks, so I hear it from three <laughs> corners. I'm, st I'm getting it from my friends now about the Jets. You don't really believe they're going to have a good season, do you? It's like, well, it's part of being Jets, Mets, Knicks is you have hope to start out, and then you get destroyed. Totally. Uh, and the Jets thing is unbelievable. I mean, he's doing everything right. You and I live in New yeah. York. It, like, he's doing it. It's almost like... If I can go back to my younger self, how would I have done this? Rodgers is 39, so he like can see the script before. He's wiser than some of the other young quarterbacks. He's wiser than some of these other Jets rookies that have come in, where he knows little gestures, going to the Knicks game at the Garden, taking a young star like like Sauce with him, yeah. uh, going to the Rangers game, going to Taylor Swift a couple of nights, just being present. It goes such a long way to be like, I am proud, for Aaron Rodgers to be like, I am proud to be a New York Jet. It is, it is. It, I mean, Jets fans are over the moon right now for just actually having a reason to be proud and excited. Well, yes, one it would be hard. It would be very difficult not to be wiser than many of the Jets rookies who have come in. That's a very low bar. But and my cynical friend points out, like, yeah, and the camera's been there every time he's done a thing like that. I'm like, <laughs> yep. oh, okay. That's the Giants fans talking. That's what the Giants fans are saying. Like, enough. Can he go in public without having you know a, a million cameras around? But you know, hilarious. honestly, I was against the Rodgers thing, Talk adamantly. I did not, I think he got a, you know, because I know from diva energy coming in this situation, mm -hmm. like you don't want it, See, it's a deal with the devil, you don't want to do it, they have nice chemistry in that locker room, they need a mensch, I was all, I was on the car train, 
Uh, no, no weird pun intended there. <laughs> but I, I thought that, you know, that's, I think that, I still think, I don't know how he'll do in New Orleans, but I think he was, the change of scenery was, is going to really help him. And I think he was about to raise his game. And I saw nothing but misery and problems from Aaron, if we even got him, mm-hmm. you know, which was not a slam dunk at all. And, uh, but now I got to say, I mean, I do admit that for one or two seasons, it's a bigger swing. There's a lower floor because so many crazy things can go wrong. But um, it is definitely a higher ceiling, and he is doing all the right things. And now I'm kind of psyched to see. He seems revitalized. He, does. he seems psyched. You know? He went. He goes to the. I mean, he didn't go to OTAs the last few years. Yeah. The Packers. He's there. He's present. And then uh, we had a great story. Zonovan Knight, who's one of the running backs, told us a great story on Good Morning Football last week that. You know, they're in the running backs room, which is such a, you know, it's only five guys and it's a running backs coach and Hackett's going through the offense and it's in a dark room and they're talking about some play and it's just the running backs. And then in the back of the room, without them knowing it, a voice pops in, like the voice of God. And he's like, actually, Hackett, I think we should do this, this and this. And it was Rogers just like over listening, like the running backs room, just wanting to lend a hand to like teach the offense. And you hear that and you're like, heart melts. You're like, yes, that's what we've been waiting for. That's what, you know, my main problem with him, apart from, you know, immunization, word games, and Joe Rogan appearances, and just weird stuff, was that, like, last season, and finally, I think you said it, and not too many people did, but I was wondering why more people didn't, was like, the dude wouldn't get with his receivers last year, they didn't gel till week nine, they Mm -hmm. probably... Would have made a playoff run if he bothered in the offseason. They started right? clicking later on in the year. Well, they're, because he wasn't with these young guys the first, you know. Not to mention, if you noticed his first game or two, which I'm sure you did, Peter. I mean, he throws to who is his good Watson? Watson? Is that the guy? Yeah. Threw them once, got kid dropped it, rolled his eyes, didn't throw them again for two weeks. Come on, what kind of what kind of parenting is this? <laughs> so. Um, I just hated that, you know, but it doesn't seem like he's doing that. I think he needed a change of scenery worse than Derek Carr. To no, be totally. And, you know, Derek Carr, when they were meeting with him, I too, I said it on Good Morning Football, I said it at the Combine, I'm like, he's an adult in the room, he's got four kids, he's yeah. not going to embarrass your franchise in any way, he's not going to do anything out of school. And, like, he'll come and he'll be a complete professional and he'll be what the Jets probably needed at quarterback, an upgrade and an adult in the room. Rodgers was a huge home run swing, and I'm with you. At first, I was like, Carr would have been enough. They had a really good team, and Carr's fine, and he needed to And then, you know, I'm just hearing things from the Jets coaches. Like, they are freaking out. This guy, Rodgers, has been unbelievable. Well, his his first press day, just the way he talks about Joe Namath, he he had me at hello. Right. (laughs) yeah. And it's not hard to attract the Jet fan. Like, I'm not saying that he's patronizing or <laughs> yeah, condescending, okay. but, like, there are some real easy roads to go down to, like, attract it. I want to be here as first. And then you start referencing Namath, and you talk about, you know, all the young talent and how good these guys are. He gets it. That's the thing. I, I don't think he's playing anybody. I think he's honest and genuine. But he also, he knows what to do in this situation, and his PR game has been 10 out of 10 since he got here. To the point where, you know, it feels like, God, he should have been here ages ago. Like, right? the guy was kind of made. Who else could step into this media market and be like, yeah, no, I, the guy makes news every time he opens his mouth anyway. So, yeah. Makes sense. Um, all right. So I'm sitting at home and I'm watching the succession finale and I'm all wrapped up in Tom Wobb's games and what. So no spoilers because I'm about I'm to binge season I'm not four. Saying a word. All right. I'm just, you know, there's a character named Tom Wobb's game. That I know. That's all, that's all it is. And there's a promo for this show, The Idol. And I'm like, this looks interesting. The weekend is in it. And. I want to say Lily Rose Depp, who is Johnny Depp's daughter, is it? Correct. This? I'm like, correct. and there your head, your face pops up doing an accent. I go, what is Hank? Is I love, I love Hank Azaria. What is this show? And I haven't seen it yet. Only one episode has aired, but everyone's texting me like, have you seen the Idol yet? It's awesome. Have you seen it yet? So, what is this show? And what is your role on the program? I play, and it was an Israeli accent you heard. Okay. I play a guy named Chaim, uh, who is. Uh, the manager of Lily Rose Depp's character named Jocelyn, uh, kind of a um, you know a pop idol, a troubled pop idol, you know of the shall we say maybe the Britney Spears mold, okay. and uh, she's in the middle of a bit of a personal and professional crisis as the story picks up, gets involved with this weekend character. Uh, he's really good. He plays this like sicko club owner. 
The weekend uh, does. Does want to be producer who they strike up this pretty intense physical, emotional relationship pretty quickly, and he starts moving in on her life. And me and the team of folks who make a lot of money off her aren't too thrilled. Yeah. Um, and I actually, my character really loves her like a daughter. Found her when she was 11, performing oh, at some wow. mall in the valley, and uh, took her through like the whole Disney thing. Yeah. And then she, you know, her first album went huge. And so it's really kind of a voyeuristic window into the music industry. And Dan Levy, who we loved in Schitt's Creek, he's, I believe, the agent. What's his role in it? He's the, publicist. he's the publicist. Publicist, perfect. Yeah. Um, and, and it's created it, by Sam Levinson, who did Sam Euphoria, Levinson who does right? the uh, does Euphoria. Uh, Euphoria is uh, an amazingly great show, but every parent's nightmare that yeah, show. I have not really. seen it, and everyone's like, if you ever have a daughter, do not go or down son the road. or son. Um, okay, yeah. I mean, look, that's why I didn't. I'd work with Sam. Sam is Barry Levinson's son, mm-hmm. legendary Barry Levinson. I worked with them. A few years ago on a movie called, oh, an HBO film called The Wizard of Lies, starring De Niro as Bernie Madoff, the Bernie oh, Madoff thing. That's great. I remember it. It was good. And um, got along well with Sam then. He called me about this. I was like, sure. <laughs> this sounds amazing. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, but I, I didn't even realize that Sam had done Euphoria. And then I started working with Sam and loving him. I'm trying to make a sports analogy to Sam. Um, Sam, he's a genuine filmmaker, like a, okay. when there aren't too many around anymore. Uh, writer, director with a real vision. He would be like somebody, to make an NFL comparison, like in, innovating an offense, like somebody bringing in the next version of an offense, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's I haven't been with somebody like that in a long time, and you notice it right away, you're like, because nothing's being done the way it usually is. And this is a different approach to it. And you're like, exactly. this is unique. Yes. And the results and if, are there. Well, at first, you're like, what the hell is all this? <laughs> you know? And uh, Can I you think get, I, just give us an example. Because like Chip Kelly came in and did the spread offense. And everyone's like, that'll never work in the NFL. And it did for a little bit. But like on the set, what or in a, in a movie or a show, what would be something unique to the million other directors who you've worked with? Well, the way I experienced it, Peter, was I got there and you know, I'm ready... You know, you get the schedule. We've got three she- scenes we're going to shoot today. And you prepare them, yeah? Be like knowing the playbook, okay? Mm-hmm. So you get there, and first thing they tell me is, we're not doing those today. Huh. I'm like, okay. Any reason? We don't know. Welcome to the idol. I'm like, all yes. right. Well, um, what are we doing? <laughs> we're doing these three scenes. And the explanation that day seemed to be that Sam was shooting on film, which is different than shooting digitally. And the light had changed in a way that, and we're shooting this big glass house, which happened to be the weekend's real house, but in the movie we were shooting it as if it was Jocelyn's house. He said the light changed. He only wants to make sure those scenes are shot in a certain type of light, so we're going to switch to these other scenes. I'm like, okay. That's a very filmic reason to yeah. change. Yeah. All right. So I learned those three scenes which over the next two hours, and then they change it again. Oh, my God. Like, no, we're not going to do those today. And it turned out that based on how the morning's work had went, they decided they needed another scene where they were already shooting. So they decided to go stay there. All this is um, very on the run and, you know, it, it, here's the equivalent. It'd be like a really great in-game coach making adjustments. Just okay? this is what I see and it's what we need for the better of the team this right what, now. Yeah, that would, we, we prepared had all game. week. We did our game plan, but in this moment, this is the Yeah, but this is what we're doing today because this is what it feels like it needs. And I think I actually called the first AD, the poor guy who was in charge of wrangling yeah. us all. I think I actually called him a young man. I went, young man, uh, <laughs> what is this? What are we doing here today? And uh, he's like, yeah, no, uh, often there's audibles that are called. Huh. And so after about two days of this, I said, okay, do me a favor. Just give me the 10 or 12 scenes that are in play, all right, that you think we will do. Because I'm sure like you can prepare, eliminate a lot. Yeah. Exactly. So at least, in other words, a playbook. Like, I'll stick, I'll have a wide playbook, and then you guys tell me what we're doing, and I'll be able to adjust, no problem. And then not only that, but, so he would kind of go with the creative hot hand, if you will. Love right? this. 
um, not only that, but then once we started the scene, um, he would start changing it based on what we were doing, how things were working. We would, he goes, do me a favor, just improvise the scene, forget yeah. about the dialogue, and we would do that. Or we would do the scene, and then we'd improvise the next 10 minutes of what might follow the scene. Um, so he started combining a sort of more Judd Apatow, I was gonna you know, say, like, Larry David approach. It's going to bring up Curb, where they say, here's, the, here's the, what happens, but the dialogue, go ahead and just let it rip, right? Is that, is that exactly. how this was? Yes, and, and, but it, wasn't, it was more like a legendary filmmaker, Robert Altman, in that it wasn't mm-hmm. so much to try to be funny. Sometimes it was. But it was more to try to get more emotionally real. Like a filmmaker, filmmaker named Mike Lee works this way too. Okay. Where you know you you get to the more raw emotion of certain things if you just kind of let it fly and don't let words constrain you. And a lot of it wasn't. Uh, he he had a ton of material, so they had to edit a lot in the end. But I'd say half the performance of my own, half was scripted, half was just stuff we came up with in the moment or on the day. The Apatow reference now, I referenced Paul Rudd in the monologue. I was talking to him. It's like, he's done all those movies with him. He says, we'll do 50 takes or something. We don't know what the final version's going to be. And then whatever felt right for Judd in the edit is what ends up in the final sequence. Then would you guys be doing like 20 takes of this? Or it would be like Clint Eastwood, one take, or Woody Allen, one take. That's good. Let's move. More, more like it was neither. Because that's also, like 20 takes starts to crush your soul so much. <laughs> one take is not enough. It was more like just extended. Like Judd will let the camera run. I never worked with Judd. Yeah. I'd love to. I, I did a movie that he produced that was short of sun in a similar way. But... Um, it was more like extended. We never really heard cut. We just yep. would kind of keep going, and um, and then sometimes, like you know, it was like a true good coach. Like Lily and I, a lot of our scenes were exactly as written. We're, you know what I mean? We just it was written well. It seemed to work. We got it fast. Bang. Mm-hmm. You know, some other scenes, there were a lot of actual music industry people in this, so for them, acting wasn't. It's more accuracy for, and consulting and like, yes, yeah. So Sam would say, "Well, don't worry about the words. Just say what you'd really say there. Cool. You know, forget even about the script. Just what would you really do in this circumstance?" And so the uh, the, the the professional actors on the set, not that they weren't pros, but you know what I mean. The more experienced yeah. actors would have to sort of roll with whatever they were doing. So I loved it on, on, on that from that standpoint. Not to mention Peter. But then after a while, cumulatively, another sports analogy, right? So great coaches, they take their actual player, they, they chuck their game plan after a while and go with the strengths of their players. And that's what Sam started doing a lot too. It's like, you seem to, I pl- started playing it a different way than he expected. So he started writing to that. That's cool. Changing things, you know, and he did that for everybody's character. Um, even the weekend, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah. the original vision for the thing it turned into something else, given on how the weekend was doing with it, um, it very profoundly, you know. That's so it was really fun and creative. I hadn't worked that way on a set that creative since I worked with Mike Nichols, you know, on the wow. Bird <laughs> yeah. Um, how's the reception been so far, and have you been happy with what you've heard from people who've watched the episode so far? Well, we had a lot of negative press leading up because of the because of, of what the way it was made or what. The well, there was, there, was, there was an article in Rolling Stone that what I described accurately just now as the yeah. creative nature of the set, you know, got called chaotic and dysfunctional. And I made a point at the press conference in Cannes of saying, no, no, no. I've been on sets that were chaotic <laughs> and dysfunctional. This wasn't that. I've been on bad teams, okay? <laughs> this wasn't that. And it was the opposite of that. The sexual, I, you know, gratefully for everyone involved, I'm not involved, I wasn't involved in the sexual uh, shenanigans in the yeah. show. That's for the young folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so I can't really speak to it. I just know that Lily was very, very comfortable with everything she had to do, felt very collaborated with, as I did on anything I was doing. And um, Sam's work is very much that way. You know, yeah. Euphoria really pushes it. This, so, so does this. And, um, uh, it might not be everybody's cup of tea, I get that, but I don't think you can deny the, the filmmaking and the compelling story that it's, and the great characters and stuff. I haven't seen Euphoria, which makes it sound like I'm talking out of my you-know-what, but it's, it's the most streamed show I think HBO has ever had, and it's also one of the rare shows that has you know, attracted the younger audience, where they're not just watching YouTube clips all day. They actually watch this show, love this show, 
And what might not be digestible for a certain generation might be something that is actually being craved and not satisfied in entertainment. And this is what might be heap of riding. You know, that's, it's a different audience necessarily than what the same audience has been watching TV for 60 years. That's exactly right, Peter. I've talked to Sam at length about this because I got kind of morbidly fascinated with Euphoria after the fact. Uh-huh. Then I watched it, and sure enough, especially the first two episodes, as a parent, it's like, they're great, but they're great the way watching a horror movie is great. You're like, oh my God, what am I seeing? It, it, it's terrifying, but very compelling. And then it settles in. It's just really good storytelling and filmmaking. And it's very good. And then I'm like, well, what am I really going to care about a, ostensibly a teen drama? You know, those days are way gone for me. But yeah, yeah. it totally transcends. The characters are so good. The story of Zendaya's journey into sobriety is the most realistic depiction of that I've ever seen. Um, it's amazing. It's just gripping. And, you know, Sam said he purposely, he's a young, he's not a teenager, but he's a young yeah. guy himself. He yeah. was hyper aware that his audience, as you just said, as you said, a YouTube clip is like a feature film to them. Long, I mean, yeah. so he was like, I can't, he purposely designed it so as not to let young attention spans waver. Things like no establishing shots. Kids shut down and start looking at their phone huh. if you show an establishing shot. It's interesting. You have to, you have to he, he was hyper aware of um, as few cuts as possible and as uh, not letting the attention span go away. Um, and he designed it uh, that way and it apparently worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've been in so many great films, so many shows, and yet... I think everyone has a different entry point for Hank Azaria. So I ask you, you know, we live in New York where it's not everyone stopping you on the street every two seconds, but when you do get stopped, is it a Simpsons voice? Is it Friends? Is it Birdcage? Is it uh, another film? Like, what do you feel like is the thing that you're getting the most these days as far as uh, Brockmire? Like, what, what is it that people are stopping you and saying, hey, I love your work in X? Some of it depends on where I am. I can sort of tell by the demographic of the person what they're likely to say, if I'm at the Mets game, I'm going to hear a lot of Brockmire. Yep. You know, most of all, it's Birdcage. Okay. Uh, young folks are very friends obsessed. A new Isn't that interesting? It's had the second life of like it's totally just, a third, it's a fourth life. Show. You're right. Every 11 year old discovers friends. You know, uh, since the show's been on, so I get a lot of that and a lot of. Uh, uh, Folks from foreign countries are friends obsessed as well. Interesting. Uh, um, but I get, you know, I'd say probably the most of Burke. And then I've been around so long now that I really never know. I get weird, like, really? You liked Herman's Head? Okay. Yeah, love Herman's Head. Fox, let's go. Yeah, early days of Fox. Uh, I, you know, so I never totally know. You know what I get more than anything else, Peter, is people know me, but they don't know from where. Oh, know? is that the like, worst, though? Why do I know you? Is yeah. That the worst question. In an airport, I get people coming to me. Why do I know you? I have very good pat answers for it. What do you say? I get a lot of you. I know you're an actor. I don't know your name. So yeah, I, thanks. Say, I, I say, I, well, I, I, I say, <laughs> I'm George Clooney. I just look really ugly in person. <laughs> uh, I was reading, you know, I do my research before any of these things, but I'm fascinated with like your career because it's got such depth and so many different roles. Before Simpsons, I mean, there was a, what was it? Hollywood Dog was the show. What was the show that? Oh, you, you are good. Tell me, yeah. tell me how, what your entry point to The Simpsons was, and whatever happened to that show? Well, that never even made it to air. So what was it? Early days of Fox, as you said. Remember the show, the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yes, the, Bob Hoskins. That, Bob Hoskins and a, a uh, um, what's his name? Great filmmaker. How am I forgetting his name? Um, yeah, I did Back to the Future and... Uh, Zemeckis. Zemeckis. Um, so, animated rabbit, live action people. That got popular. Fox decided to try one of those. They did a pilot of a show called Hollywood Dog based on a cartoon that was popular at the time. Uh, a, a comic strip that was popular at the time. It was called Hollywood Dog and it would be like in Hollywood your Sunday Dog. paper? Okay. I guess. <laughs> I, don't, I um, love this. I did the voice of the dog. Oh, I think talk like this. Hey, how you doing? It's Hollywood dog. <laughs> I love already right Hollywood out. dog. And uh, that sh- back then, back in the old days, Peter, 
they made a, every network, even Fox, made like 100 pilots. And they pilot up, seasoned. Like, yes. So everybody worked pilot. Everyone loved pilot season because almost every actor worked. Uh, but only 10 or 15 of them made it to air out of like the 50 to 80 they made. Hollywood Dog was one of them. And then, um, so not long after that, I got a call from uh, head of casting The Simpsons, a woman named Bonnie Piatula, who worked on the show for years but has stopped. And um, knew me from that just through Fox. And it was like almost an open call. It was an open call, but it did, I didn't have a voiceover agent. It just came through my regular agent. Wow. And I walked over one day to Fox, and Sam Simon and uh, Matt Groening were in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam has passed away since, but he and Matt and Jim Brooks were the original creators. And uh, I was doing a play in Hollywood at the time. I was playing a drug dealer in this play, and I was doing an impression a vocal impression of Pacino from Dog Day Afternoon in that play. <laughs> so I was sort of talking like this, that sort of early Al Pacino play. I hear Mo already. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> so I did that. And they were like, well, we want it to be gravelly. So you take young Al Pacino and you make it gravelly. <laughs> and you get Mo the bartender. And they said, great, can you come record this? I'm like, now? I never had that happen. Like you get the job in the room and then you do it. I realize now they probably they probably had like eight guys do that that day, and then they just kept the one they liked. So even when I thought I had the job, I probably didn't. But I guess they liked what I did, and then each week I'd come back and do another voice or two. I'd like wig them the next week, and on and on. And uh, after about a year of that, they made me uh, a regular. You know what I found out years later, Pierre? Yeah. How about this for craziness? So apparently, there was an original Mo the Bart. They were replacement casting at that point. They had had a Mo the Bartender. And then I was like, oh, wow, really? And then years after I found that out, I think Matt Groening and I were doing some, like we were being judges on some Food Network food show, okay. right? Chop, one of these things. Yeah. It was from one of those. Not, it wasn't Chop, but it was something. <laughs> I said, you know, Matt, why did you fire... That what what didn't you like about the the voice work of that original Mo? And he said, "Oh, we we thought he was great. We liked him a lot." I said, "Well, then what did you fire him for?" He said, "The guy was just kind of a jerk. Hmm. Just uh, what a lesson, right?" Oh my God! So the guy, the poor guy, he's since passed away. I think. Can you imagine the rest of his life? Well, that's what I mean. The guy was like the Pete Best of The Simpsons. You know what I mean? And it's like, dude, don't. That's terrible. I felt really bad, actually, yeah. hearing that. And he was you know, probably in his 20s, young guy, like, you know, and lived with that the rest of his life. That's heartbreaking. He got, he went, he was a, a really established voiceover guy. And Jim Brooks, talk about takes, in the early days of The Simpsons. And Jim Brooks, of everything he does, he likes to do take after take. He mm -hmm. really tries to get it right. And I think the guy didn't like it and sort of snapped at them all one day. I know. Um, when I was a kid, and I'm not trying to date you, obviously, you know, Simpsons have been going on for... Like, I'm old. It's years. fine. Not even you're old, but it's just Simpsons. I'm, I'm certainly not dating you if I say I grew up watching The Simpsons. I think everyone grew up watching The Simpsons. But I remember, like, being a craze, like... I mean, I know now you could say, oh, well, no, this is bigger now. Or American Idol was a bigger craze in the 2000s. But, like... Every kid had the T-shirt. I wasn't allowed to wear the T-shirt in school. It was banned to have Bart Simpson in school. <laughs> Can you believe there was a time when Bart Simpson was considered edgy? <laughs> you know why? Because it said, eat my shorts. And it was yeah, like, you, you can't. Shorts. Can't have it. You know, cowabunga. <laughs> you can't have it. Um, <laughs> did you guys feel it? Like, it was the biggest. It was on the cover. He was, I think Bart Simpson was on the cover of Time and Newsweek at the same time. Like, like a Springsteen-like celebrity. But, like, did you feel that when you were f recording those first episodes? That this thing could be what it... Forget what it's become, but that first year, what a sensation it was. Yes and no. It, no in that Fox itself was two years old. Mm -hmm. What was and it? Married Children, you guys. Tracy Herman's Ullman, Head, Herman's Tracy Head. Ullman, and a few other things. Cops. Cops, for sure. Cops was a huge hit for them. Mm -hmm. And that was the first you know, new network. It was ABC, CBS, and NBC, and PBS. And whatever couple of local channels you had. And that was it, children. That was it. <laughs> and um, 
So a new network, you're like, you kidding? That's not going to last. So you didn't even know if the network was going to survive, let alone an animated primetime show on the network. I mean, that said, James L. Brooks at that point was a legend, a le yeah. and deservedly so. I mean, yeah. the guy was arguably the greatest. I mean, I don't know if anybody before or since has had that kind of success in TV and film at the same time, you know, winning Emmys and Oscars at the same time and doing it himself, like the real deal, writing it all and and uh, creating it all. And, and um, so the fact that Jim Brooks was standing there to my 22 year old self, it's how old when I started doing 22, it was. 22, really? Yeah, when well, I first yeah. auditioned, wow. was um, impressive. And, you know, back then, I take it for granted now. Now, again, I don't, you know, my finger is hardly on the pulse beat of pop culture and comedy anymore. But then it was without my even realizing it. There was less to track back then. But um, I had a strong sense just from a, a youthful comedic standpoint that this thing was pretty special. And then I remember it was an L.A. film festival and they showed the shorts of The Simpsons in it. And the audience went crazy. Really? Crazy. Before even they were in the Tracy Ullman show, they were showing them at this festival? They were f culled from the Tracy Ullman shows before we premiered as a half-hour show. but um, And the audience I, went nuts. Yeah, my peers, my... my for, I, it just struck a chord with us youngsters. I don't know exactly why. I mean, my um, friend. I mean, we were in, I guess, middle school. We would. I mean, and then they would air in syndication. We would memorize lines. You could put on a Simpsons episode for the first ten seasons. I could tell you every line of every episode, and that was kind of the norm. That's what we did. Um, to, you know, yes, and I had equivalent. You know, I grew up worshiping Bugs Bunny and all the Warner Brothers cartoons, and then. You know, there were certain shows that uh, meant everything to me. You know, when I was growing up, like Happy Days and yeah. um, All in the Family, early days. That, and Jim Brooks, you know, Mary Tyler Moore. And even into my early 20s, like I grew up as a teen on, on Family Ties. Yeah. Um, and so I, know, I do know well what it's like to have a show mean a, a lot. And I'm thrilled that, you know, both from an animation standpoint and just an iconic standpoint that... To pass, to be able to be a part of passing that tradition along means a lot. Awesome. To me. we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap it here. Um, as we record on this June day, if I ask you in six months, what's the ideal situation for your New York Jets? As we close, um, paint the picture for me. You're, it's a winter day. You got your 14 year old son. Are we headed towards a playoff game, or what? What are we thinking? Is actually, you know, what would you be happy with if you could sign up for it right now? Well. I mean, the ceiling is an obvious answer. But, I mean, I saw the interesting article today, article today, Peter, that the projections are, like, all over the board. For all the over. The, the yeah. sports books have no consistency and, like, everywhere from eight wins to 14 wins. I even see a – I saw a four-win projection. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be averaging out at, like, 8.6 or something weird like it's that. about what they did last year with Zach Wilson and Strebler. yeah. Uh, right, that I think I even heard you talking about how much a defense can fluctuate year to year, and their, their schedule is a lot harder this year mm -hmm. than it was last the year. AFC is loaded, you know. But in a way, you look at it like well, they're, they're going to have to beat those teams if yeah. they're going to win. So let's let's find out. Um, to me, honestly, like I'll, I'll I answer this from a Brett Favre perspective. Okay, guy came. We were all excited in a similar fashion. He went eight and three. Yep. Hurt his freaking shoulder, and they lost the rest of the games except for one, and they missed the playoffs. The next year, he took the freaking Vikings to the, NFC, the NFC Championship, a game. couple of plays away from the Super Bowl. And because obviously he just wanted to do that. I mean, it's hard not to think about what if he just stayed a Jet for that second year. So to me. Honestly, especially because I'm um, being Jets, Mets, Knicks, I'm so I have such PTSD that yeah. if the team just really plays well and is competitive, I, I think if they don't make the playoffs, I'll be genuinely disappointed. disappointed. Yeah. But um, if they're really competitive and um, uh, make any version of a run, I'll be very, very happy. And if it looks like Aaron would come back one more year and try it again, I, I'd be thrilled with that. 
but I, I don't I don't dare hope beyond that. <laughs> I love it. Um, you're you're too seasoned as a fan to to start you know planning a parade down Broadway, and yet oh god yeah, and yet so many are. Uh, well, you imagine it. You can't. Of I mean, when the Knicks beat when the Knicks beat the Cavaliers, I just could not help imagining. I know a Knicks Lakers final. Or like I couldn't a, help. Or like a nationally televised Eastern Conference final. Forget that. Like I was in the same boat, you know, obviously, and it's like. Wow, what if we're hosting at the Garden, like the Eastern Conference Final? Like, what? Like, it's insane. I know. I know. I know. I know. Um, you're a good man. Thanks for going long here. Uh, appreciate it. You're in the Idol on HBO. I've got this. I feel so ridiculous. I've got my home set up. If you're listening on audio, and my one lone sports Emmy is behind me. I'm talking to Hank, who's probably got 600, and he doesn't have anything behind him. Let me just tilt the camera up here. <laughs> there they Whoa. are. Uh-oh. <laughs> Bobbleheads and Emmys. That's <laughs> so good. I felt so, I felt like such a loser. I've got one for, but I'm like, no, well, that's a nice, it's a nice starter <laughs> Emmy, Peter. It's a nice starter Emmy. We'll get there. Uh, Hank Azaria, such a fan of yours from TV, and also, I also think you're the best guest on Eisen. You're the best guest on Dan Levitar, and I think you're a tremendous voice in the sports media. Jim Brockmeyer has returned to the Levitar show. Check us Is out. He coming Pretty back? much everything. Oh, he's been. I've been back the last couple weeks. Okay, so we can get not not the formal podcast, but I do a segment of Dan pretty much every week, usually on Thursdays. You're great with those guys. Hank, thanks so much for joining this podcast. Thanks, Peter.